In this lecture, we're going to examine some of the constraints that exist when we're dealing with wave functions in quantum mechanics. Now, in quantum mechanics, every single system, for example, an electron, has its own wave function associated with that system. Now, we know that the wave function is obtained by solving Schrodinger's equation and the wave function itself basically provides us with all the information we need to know about the motion and behavior of that system. Now our system, for example, could be an electron. Now, if we know what the wave function is, which by the way depends on the position x as well as on the time t, if we know what the wave is, what the wave function is, this gives us the single valued probability amplitude of the wave produced by that system. So basically, this gives us information about the actual wave itself. It gives us the amplitude, how high or how low our wave goes. Now, what about if we take the square of the absolute value of our wave function? Well, this gives us information about the particle of that system. So basically, it gives us the probability distribution, the probability density of that particle that produces that wave. This basically tells us the probability, how likely it is that we are to find that particle in a certain position position x at a certain time t. Now, for this quantity to actually make sense, it has to be between 0 and 1. We can get a probability that is negative, and likewise, we can get a probability that is greater than 1. So, basically, in order for a wave function to be useful and physically meaningful and measurable, it must satisfy a certain set of requirements. Now, requirement number 1. So the wave function must satisfy, it must be a solution to Schrodinger's equation, to the following equation, which is basically the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. Now, what exactly do we mean by requirement 1? Well, to understand what we mean, let's recall an analogy. So, let's suppose we're dealing in classical mechanics. So we have the equation force equals mass times acceleration. So remember, in quantum mechanics, Schrodinger's equation is the analogous equation to force equals ma. So in classical mechanics, we use this equation to study the motion of our object. In quantum mechanics, we use this equation. So let's suppose that we know the force on our object is 10 newtons. Now, if we know the force is 10 newtons, that means if we plug in a value of, let's say, 1 kilogram for the mass and 2 meters per second for our acceleration, 1 times 2 does not equal 10. So, for example, 1 and 2 are not solutions to this equation. And in the same exact way, our wave function must satisfy the solution to the Schrodinger equation. That's exactly what we mean by step 1. So, let's suppose our wave function does in fact satisfy uh, requirement number 1. What else must it satisfy? So, let's move on to requirement number 2. The wave function must in fact be a continuous function. And that's simply because the probability must also be a continuous value. It must range from 0 to 1 and must be a value in between. So, once again, Again, since the square of the absolute value of the wave function psi represents the probability of finding our particle at some position x and some moment in time t, and the probability itself must be a continuous value between 0 and 1, then we see that the wave function itself must also be continuous. So basically, the wave function cannot look like this. It cannot stop here and then continue upward here. It must be a continuous function like so. 
So let's move on to the final requirement. So the final requirement states that the wave function must in fact be normalized. So normalized is a term that basically comes from mathematics, from statistics and probability. So what exactly does it mean for a wave function to be normalized for any equation for that matter to be normalized? So the wave function must correctly give us the probability value. That is, the probability should never exceed 1 and the probability should never be a negative quantity. More precisely, the probability of finding a particle at any one location or another should always be 1. So what exactly do we mean by that? So let's suppose we're dealing with one dimension. So we have some type of particle. Let's suppose an electron found somewhere along the x-axis. And the x-axis extends to negative infinity and positive infinity. So, and this region here is basically our wave function. So this red curve represents our wave function. Now let's choose an infinitely small distance, an infinitely small region in space along the x-axis given by the following region. Now for our wave function to actually be physically measurable, physically meaningful, if we take the square of the absolute value of the wave function and multiplied by this infinitely small distance given by dx, this should give us the probability of finding our particle in this infinitely small region given by dx. Now if we slice all our, if we slice our entire x-axis into these infinitely small regions and then we integrate them from negative infinity to positive infinity, if we take the sum of all these probabilities, the entire probability should give us 1. This is exactly what we mean by our wave function being normalized. So basically, what exactly does it mean for the integral from negative to positive infinity of the square of the absolute value of psi be equal to 1 with respect to dx? So basically, the sum of all the probabilities along the entire x-axis, along all of space, should always be 1. It should be 100%. Now, what that basically means is we should be able to find our particle somewhere along the x-axis. It must be somewhere along the x-axis. And when we integrate all these probabilities, when we sum up all these probabilities, the probability should in fact be equal to 1. It cannot exceed it and it cannot be anything less than 1.